Okay, so good morning um, to everybody present here in the chamber. Um, today we are having our Cannabis and Gaming Committee meeting here in the Senate chamber at the Honorable Jesus P. Muffness Memorial Building, Capitol Hill, Saipan. It is August 19, 2020, um, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, Lex, it is 10, what do you got, 10.07? Okay, 10.07. And I'd like to uh, welcome the, the cannabis commissioners, um, our cannabis managing, di is managing director, right? Managing director, and um, um, it's nice to see that our uh, special assistant for cannabis is, is here. I will still call you a special assistant, uh, nonetheless. No, um, you know, we're, we're thankful that your, um, your guidance is still uh, uh, present with the commission. Um, former speaker, uh, Joseph de Leon Guerrero. Um, with us today um, in the Cannabis Gaming Committee, um, we have myself as the chair. Um, our vice chair, uh, Senator Six Two Igis Homer, will be uh, will be uh, not be um, here today. Um, he has some other um, important uh, meetings to attend. Um, Senator Francisco Q. Cruz is here with us. Uh, Senator um, Justo Quiroga will be joining us uh, later. Uh, Senator Francisco M. Borja will not be present today. Uh, we have Senator Jude U. Hofschneider, our Vice President of the Senate um, here in the chamber, and Senator Teresita A. Santos, um, also a member of the committee. Um, assisting us um, um, is the LB staff. Uh, we have our Council uh, Bermudez here to my left, um, Alexis Hofschneider, our Legislative Assistant, and who serves as the LA uh, for the Cannabis and Gaming Committee is um, right in front of me, and Mr. Ben Terlahi, uh, to my right, will be as, um, assisting. Uh, so with that, I did call to order. I want to ask uh, Ms. Hofschneider if you can please call the roll for the record. Senator Francisco M. Borja. Senator Francisco Q. Cruz. Yes. Senator Jude U. Hofschneider. Present. Senator Sixto K. Igisomar. Senator Justo S. Kituba. Senator Vinny F. Sablan. Present. Senator Teresita A. Santos. Mr. Chairman, four members of the Senate Cannabis and Gaming Committee are present. Three are absent. Thank you, Lex. And with the members present, we do constitute a quorum uh, for this committee meeting. Um, and now I'd like to entertain any, a motion to adopt today's agenda. Uh, moved by Senator Hofschneider, second by Senator Cruz. Uh, discussion? Okay, all in, all in favor to adopt today's Cannabis and Gaming Committee meeting agenda, please say aye. All who oppose, say nay. Okay, motion carries and our agenda um, is adopted. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, before we, we, we start with um, uh, public comments, um, I want to welcome uh, the commission again. Uh, thank you for um, making time to come in and uh, give the committee and, of course, the the public um, updates on uh, the movement, <coughs> the cannabis movement <coughs> in general. Before I night, do also the record, uh, Lex, please um, uh, acknowledge that uh, Senator uh, Uso Kiroga is uh, present in this meeting. Um, there's a lot of work. <coughs> I know there was a lot of work uh, heading into um, uh, the passage of, of the legislation and the the amended version of the legislation um, and then uh, as the commission assembled um, officially um, you know you guys have have put in so much hours in, in coming up with with regulations emergency regulations and we were all aware that uh, you do have adopted emergency regulations which which is um, <coughs> Uh, what did did go through the Commonwealth Register, so that's a uh, that's a great um, accomplishment, and I want to thank you guys for your work. Uh, we have a, a long uh, road ahead of us, especially during this time, you know, in the pandemic that we're facing. Um, we are live uh, right now um, in our meeting, so that we can uh, give the public a chance to uh, participate and listen, and hopefully um, their questions um, may be answered. I do have some questions uh, from constituents um, via email, um, you know, that I will be asking for, um, you know, for our community. But we're going to have a, uh, it's going to be a very challenging time, you know, we've, 
during the inception and the the initial deliberations of uh, this cannabis movement and this cannabis industry uh, we were all hopeful and uh, comforted that we would have something that would be sort of a a revenue generating industry that would assist and aid in uh, the ability for the government to collect revenues and fees and uh, penalties if um, if needed uh, to assist the government in providing uh, essential services in all realms of um, of our societal um, uh, assistance programs uh, to our public so um, as as we all know we are at a point where um, our backs are against the walls we're in the corner and we are battling something that um, you know none of us has, has ever even thought of and we are um, struggling in our finances and um, a lot of outsourced uh, uh, um, external factors have, have placed us in this position so we're we're really hopeful that uh, the commission and this industry um, with the help of all the other government agencies you know being partners um, we can move forward and start feeling some sort of uh, um, financial movement right for um, you know for our government it's we're at a point uh, um, where we need to be creative and think outside the box and try everything um, in our power to uh, um, to continue to um, try to ensure that we have these these programs for our um, our community members. Um, so with that, I'm now going to um, open um, on number two, agenda on number two, our public comments. I will open up the podium for public comments if there are if there are any um, comments that uh, um, relate to uh, cannabis. Uh, you may post questions, but uh, there will be no interaction with uh, um, with with the members. Um, the questions may be posed, and say the mem uh, the members of the committee may um, post those questions to the um, to the commissioners um, um, here today. So, anyone for public comments? It's now open. And just state your name for the record. We have, uh, based on our Senate rules, uh, we've got a five minute um, allowance for our public comments. So um, you can go ahead. Good morning. Um, is this, is it okay if I take this off? If uh, my name is Marissa Flores Ada. I'm here as a private citizen. Um, I've been um, following this bill since its conception and in its written form and uh, since this whole started with this in industry. Um, I have several comments. Um, I know that this is recorded, so um, if there are minutes to be taken and uh, my, my questions can't be answered, um, I'm sure that uh, the committee would provide uh, some insight, especially to the general public. So with the creation of the now Cannabis Commission, I have several comments in regard to the industry itself. Um, number one is the uh, job creation that this particular industry may entail. There are several licenses available for private businesses uh, to own cultivation and um, retail um, sales, Based on every license that's available for uh, purchase or for, um, I guess, to operate in this type of business, how many jobs does the commission project uh, to create with this industry? So for every license, um, my question is how many jobs will this uh, industry create based on every license available for a private vendor? or business owner? How many licenses are you projected to sell? Considering that this it's seen a my wide, Saipan is 14 miles long. Uh, land is obviously restricted when it comes to retail sales. It needs to have you guys decided on zoning. Um, and if there is a zoning factor, where will this be? Um, and this applies to all islands, including Tinian and Rhoda. How would these um, businesses affect the infrastructure? So if we go as far as Rhoda, and if they're gonna be, um, Rhoda is known for rich soil. They're known to produce a lot of agriculture. 
our licenses going to be hailed to just farming? And if so, how wide and how would that affect the infrastructure based on water and power? Will it cost the community of Rhoda more to pay as far as rates for utilities? Will the businesses um, in turn um, be obligated to number one, purchase their own feeder as it was with IPI? And number two, provide a reverse osmosis system so that water, which is very scarce in many places of the CNMI, will they prov be providing their own water with a system that they will be, um, I would assume, I hope to assume that they would, be, they would purchase in order to um, be a part of this industry. For Tinian, um, we all know that that was a airfield at one point. Um, they're also known as um, providing some agricultural means to the CNMI. Uh, so with that, you're looking at very limited land because most of it is homestead. So if the business was to be, uh, if a license was to be um, purchased and it was to be held in Tinian, again, how will that affect the infrastructure to the people? Utilities and water is the most important. And then do you know how many licenses will be sold based on the jurisdiction with the limited amount of land already? As far as job creation, if the jobs were to be created, what are we as a community or as a commission, will they be paying federal minimum wage? And if so, as we all know, federal minimum wage isn't enough. Will the owners provide other benefits such as health insurance? And will there be a percentage between the employer employee for insurance coverage, just as it is in the central government? 70-30, I believe. Will there uh, be 401k and retirement available? Again, employment is a big, big concern, especially now with COVID. We are at an un unemployment rate unseen before in the CNMI. And if these licenses were to be purchased, we would like to ensure that the people who are especially a part of this community are given these types of benefits if 725 should be the minimum wage. Because the industry is considered a type two, I believe, on the uh, drug, um, I guess, schedule, thank you, sir. That makes it uh, drug money, I quote, and FDIC banks will not hold this type of revenue. There are only two non-FDIC banks within the industry. Where would this money be held? So those are my questions, and I think those are very valid questions, and I think the commission is responsible for regulating how these type of businesses will operate. The longevity of this is crucial because, again, with limited amount of land and the fact that we cannot transport between islands due to federal regulations, this makes this industry uh, very thin. So, again, we're allowing our people to plant for self-medication, but when you're opening this industry for tourism and for that purpose, you have to strike out the fact that in the next three years, maybe we might not have any tourists at all. So this will leave the business, if it is open, only to our own people. And we, I think we've forgotten that our local people, the community members are a driving force of this community. The biggest issue here that we have to face right now is if these licenses are sold, what is the job creation for our community that we will create and how are we gonna protect and ensure sustainability? 
We do not want to have a repeat of the gaming. And I think the people have suffered too much. So if this commission is going to be entrusted with the fact that this is supposed to be and the intent of this is supposed to create revenue we also have to remember that we must create the we must protect the people that will work for this industry first and foremost the resources must be protected which is our land the water the utilities that must be also included this not this should not funnel back to the people anymore. This commission has a very big job ahead of them. And developing uh, regulations is just a small portion of that. We're looking at sustainability for more than 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Flores Ada. Um, your concerns and questions are noted and they are valid concerns and questions and this is um, the very reason that we have these committee meetings um, for updates and um, answers to these questions as um, uh, the commission and the members of this committee know that um, you know the the community members um, are you know have have valid questions and concerns that should be uh, should be considered by by both bodies by this this committee um, and the commission as well so um, at this point we're gonna close public comments unless there's anybody else for public comments nobody okay um, and we're gonna go down to uh, item agenda or item number three in our agenda which is report and at this time I'm gonna give um, uh, the chairperson um, for the commission uh, and uh, the managing director and uh, any 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 of you on the panel to um, uh, give your opening remarks or um, just some little updates in general and after that we'll we'll go ahead and open it up to the members to drive some uh, some questions um, that may you know um, that may arise um, uh, throughout this deliberation thank you so the floor is open to um, our chairwoman good morning uh, for the record my name is Nadine Villian Guerrero, and I am the chairperson for the Cannabis Commission. Um, I just wanted to first open up with thanking you, Senator Vin, for helping us with the twenty-five thousand uh, dollar appropriation. It, you know, resources are very scarce, and uh, twenty-five thousand might not sound like a lot, but it really did help us get a long way as far as. Um, getting some things ready for the office and so with that we're looking to open the office by September um, I also want to say thank you for allowing Miss uh, Hoff Schneider into our meetings because it's I think it's been a very healthy uh, way of communicating um, so hopefully that continues I know um, she also has a different schedule that she has to abide by so <laughs> whenever she can um, we appreciate it when she does join us. Um, as far as the operations, uh, I think I'll turn it over to MD, but um, I just wanted to express our gratitude for allowing us to get further in, in trying to get our o office stood up. Okay, before, uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And before yeah. we, we move on, just so that we um, kind of lay out uh, our, our discussions, um, the chair, some of the, the topics the chair wanted to um, uh, updates on were were the regulations and um, and permits. I know just in general we don't have to go into um, into all the different uh, um, uh, categories and types. But I know that there um, there were emergency regulations that were adopted. Um, also the office. Okay, so that's one. And then number two is also the office and the status of. Um, well, you just you 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 just mentioned that. Um, uh, the office will be open in September, so I'm assuming that you got the the local appropriation of uh, 25 uh, uh, drawn down for um, for you to um, to use. Um, and then I'm not sure if you're aware of your so that's number two, right? Regulations and permits your office. Um, number three is the budget and the submission of the governor on how much uh, was um, was budgeted for the commission and for the operations. Um, and then enforcement, the plans and enforcement, legislation, if there's needed legislation to 
um, you know, to a man and, uh, and zoning, that's it. So just to kind of really lay out the platform of, of, of the meeting today, um, these are some of the things that the chair wanted to, uh, to discuss. Um, so before I give the floor to MD, um, go ahead, guys, MD. Just quickly, did this our representatives from Tinian and Rota like chimed in in this meeting or no? Okay, yeah, no, because I mean, I hear that you're going to be discussing also, and we want to hear from them. But uh, maybe, Mr. Chairman, if if it's not too much to ask, uh, we after their presentation, maybe we can invite the the respective commission members maybe through a phone to kind of give us an update on how they're doing on their respective you know definitely if we can uh, if it's okay with um, yeah you know, Molika or if you guys can report out yeah, you know? yeah I did uh, so. um, uh, during the announcement of the meeting uh, I did um, um, invite and open okay. the invitation to every to all the uh, the commissioners and I actually had on my notes uh, uh, reports from each of the commissioners on each okay. of the senatorial districts but uh, if we can get Jonathan in here while we s you know we begin and see if we can get them on and maybe MD you can you can contact them and uh, see if they're available um, you know if they I, they could be at the farm they could be at the beach but if they have their phone and mm -hmm. our Microsoft Teams or Zoom is set up then they can kind of call in uh, just so that our members from uh, each senatorial district can post questions uh, um, uh, for them so um, with that we'll go ahead and continue while uh, our Sarge uh, um, reaches out to our IT um, tech to set uh, the Microsoft Teams or Zoom up. So um, go ahead, uh, uh, MD, you wanted to, it's, it's, we're still on just opening statements from each of you and then we'll, we'll move on, okay? Good morning, um, for the record, my name is Monique Borisablan. I am the Managing Director for the CNMI Cannabis Commission. Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for having us here today. And also thank you for your endless support as we have really made it pretty far down the line, but we also know we still have a long path and journey to go down. Um, to give you guys a brief update, on August 4, 2019, uh, 2020, <laughs> the My Cannabis Commission had opened up the cannabis industry. By opening up, I mean applications for both homegrown marijuana registry and cannabis commercial licensing were made available to the public. Um, I would like to say that this is definitely a landmark for the CNMI. Um, has it been easy? Definitely not. But has it been something that is a work in progress? Definitely. And we're glad to be here today to be able to consult to see how we can work together furthermore to assist the public and those who are interested in the commercial and non-commercial side of the cannabis industry. So thank you all for having us here today. Thank you to my commissioners and our special advisor for standing by my side no matter what. <laughs> no choice, they have to stand by my side. <laughs> Just kidding. But yes, thank you for having us here today and we look forward to the questions and also having you know, deep and thorough conversation on how do we progress further into this industry. Thank you. Thank you, MD. Um, anybody else on the panel? Matt or our former speaker, if you would like to some words or do you want to we'll go ahead and draw okay so go ahead Matt you have uh, just really quick I'm thank you um, for having us here today um, and I think there has been um, just in, in the public comment period some really good questions that were brought up um, and it's definitely a conversation that we would love to have if if the committee would like to go into a little bit more detail um, and that it that we've considered this product in the, the regulations as a work in progress for sure um, in a lot of ways uh, we're, this is an industry that never existed here formally in the CNMI, and so understanding where the market failures are and where are the uh, interests in regulating as the industry develops is something that is a keen interest to the commission and to our further work in amending and structuring a system that, that does have the greatest amount of benefits. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. And so we have John here with us. Um, John, so you can set up the, uh, we want to have our two Commissioners from the first and second senatorial district uh, chime in if they're available. Uh, the managing director is contacting them as soon as that platform is set up, um, and if um, they can chime in, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll allow them to do that. But um, with that, uh, we've thank you for for those opening statements um, from the commissioners and the MD. Um, and now um, I do have some questions, but I will open up the floor for. Um, 
the members of the committee to pose uh, any questions or, or concerns and uh, ideas that, that they have. So um, to begin, uh, I'd like to recognize our uh, Vice President of the Senate, Senator Jude Yuhoff Schneider. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, former Speaker, welcome back to the legislature, sir. Um, Matt, Nadine, and of course, uh, Monique, and everybody that's here. Um, I appreciate the opening, the public comment was mentioned earlier by Ms. Uh, Marisa Flores Abbe. But uh, I wanted to, Mr. Chairman, just to, uh, I remember asking this question uh, uh, during the onset of the, I think the confirmation or whether it's confirmation or just the, the legislation itself, the creation of the cannabis name, uh, knowing that there is a return back of our, uh, some merch land about three miles. Um, and maybe Mr. Matt Leonguero can, can help me out with which part of the CNMI was actually given back to the in the waters, uh, to the point that uh, uh, the uh, public during the public comment somebody mentioned about inter island transshipment. Uh, is that something that if you guys flush that out with the Assistant Attorney General as far as how can we overcome that in terms of inter island? Uh, um, I, I guess there's no way to do an exchange of commerce no, because we're fragmented, eh? so we need to somehow send something, you know, just like any other commodities. But knowing fully the schedule to uh, classification and the federal government has yet to declassify this as a schedule two, uh, but took the position of along the state and territories and commonwealth of the Marano, the Marano Islands to regulate their own that's brought us here today. So have, can can you just maybe help us try to understand how far we've gone so far as far as that is concerned? If you don't mind. Um, <coughs> so I think this is an important um, clarification obviously to make in that the federal uh, statutes pertaining to the sale and transportation of marijuana are still in play. And within the statute and within the AG's um, interpretation of, of their responsibilities as legal counsel for, for a government entity, it's, uh, it's in their uh, practice to advise whenever asked a question about certain processes and allowances of the CNMI law that they are limited in, in their ability to discuss things because of the federal restriction on sale. So we have had conversations with the Attorney General's office about this, but m more so we've had conversations with customs, and it should be uh, that the importation and the exportation restriction shouldn't necessarily pertain to inter-island transport, and that's the interpretation of the commission. Um, and there's many other examples in the United States of, of jurisdictions segregated by water, um, which transport would be a necessity, um, places in Washington, in areas around the United States where transportation by various means is a requirement of the industry to succeed. Um, there, there are, within that initial caveat of the federal um, overlay and the federal restrictions that are still present, there's still a uh, likelihood and there's still a possibility of, of problems that may arise in the inter-island transport. And that's something that need to be aware of, I think. Yeah, but um, Mr. Chairman, nice to have you. So, so, is it, so the the fact that three miles were was given back to the CNMI ownership no uh, by way of a uh, resolution has that been considered uh, yeah I mean that's that's a really valid point that that as it goes forward and as if if um, certain arms choose to and an, um, implement their their mandates or what they feel is their their interest in either drug trafficking or or whatever the federal requirements are. That would, that would be an interesting conversation to have, but you're correct. The they did transfer out the submerged lands in many of the areas uh, relating to the monument, and um, but maintained uh, three mile access and ownership uh, within the military lease zone north of Tinian. Within the so so in essence, uh, if I understand you correctly, without having the document in front of us, so anything that is not within the DOD lease uh, oversight is three miles. Is is returned back to the CNMI? Um, in most areas, from my understanding, from my uh, yeah. at the moment recollection of, of the discussions yeah. at the time. No, because this this is a uh, I think I think it's important because not necessarily just for the cannabis, but even to initiate a legislation to regulate some of that in that 
uh, context, no? Uh, it can it can definitely uh, uh, help us. Um, it's never been done before. I think we we tried to get 200 miles, but we we got three right. So better some than none. So I guess. So is there any timetable as far as that is concerned? Do you need any legislation or any legislation for that, that may be uh, in the offing? I mean, is that something that the commission can re require or I mean uh, request or is it too? Uh, we're, um, we're we're too ahead of the ball game here. Or this question is. Um, and uh, uh, if I could, I think the the legislature and and many of the members in this room that discussed the original bill. I believe we're in, we're in the consultation process on the original bill, did a really excellent job in segregating um, the responsibilities and making sure that federal law was had, had very limited intersection with local law. And in the being um, silent on this issue, I think that was, was uh, appropriate, considering there's still open questions as to enforcement when it comes to transport on the water. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah. to the to the direct question, um, uh, we can definitely we are in the process of maintaining a running list of issues that we feel sh the we would like to present to the legislature at at a, at a time that that um, you'd be interested in in receiving that. Um, and as the industry develops, really a lot of a lot of the decisions and the actions by the actors, whether or not they feel it's a market necessity to transport to Saipan, which would make sense, but we still haven't figured out whether there's sure. demand for that. And as that develops, then we would see the issues. Um, just one more question and then I'll yield. How are, how are we doing so far with uh, rolling out almost a month of, uh, are we making money or is there, <laughs> uh, not, not making money per se, but like are we having takers really coming and, and applying? I like to say yes, definitely. There are a lot of inquiries and a lot of interested cannabis applicants, especially for the cannabis commercial licensing side. There are a lot of people who have been coming and asking various questions. There are a couple of roadblocks that we had come across um, that are hindering our cannabis licensees from actually submitting their complete application. Um, one of the roadblocks that we did come across is zoning um, for Saipan. Zoning authorization requires that currently in Saipan Local Law 21-15, I believe, it's passed in June uh, of 2020. It specifies cannabis farms, retail, and lounge, but for but it it puts those cannabis licensees under a what what's called a conditional use permit, and the conditional use permit is actually a very lengthy process in order to actually get that permit. It requires an application, um, various documentation to be submitted. It also requires the applicant, prior to even applying for a cannabis license, to go through a public hearing with zoning where they would have to appear before the board and their board would have to approve whether or not they will get the zoning authorization. Now, zoning, we have been in communication with zoning trying to figure out this issue. They do have a backlog for their public hearings. They only have about five slots per public hearing or per public um, meeting and they only meet once a month. So in order for a cannabis licensee to actually submit their complete application to the Cannabis Commission, they would need their zoning authorization. In order to get a business license, you need a zoning authorization. So that's kind of one of the main obstacles that we've been going through, but we are working with these applicants to try to figure out a way to see what we can do. FMA Chair, if you want to go in a little bit, or Matt, about. The Saipan Local Law 21-15 is very broad. Um, they generalize the cannabis farming, whereas they generalize cannabis farming, whereas in our regulations and our law, we break down production into four different licenses, microproducer, class one, class two, and class three. Class three goes to about 5,000 square feet. So you can see that there should be necessary guidelines for at least each of these various yeah. licenses. So, so, so you're saying, Monique, that uh, it's specified in the, the enabling statute? No, it's not. The what you just said. So for our for our for our current statute, twenty sixty six and twenty one dash oh five, our licenses are broken down for production by four licenses. Okay. In zoning, it generalizes it as just cannabis farming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. 
I'm, I'm going to ask later, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Hofschneider. Now um, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Senator uh, Teresita Santos. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, um, Chair and um, Director and the rest of the uh, um, Gaming Commission. Welcome to our chamber. Um, Ms. Flores uh, brought a very legitimate concern again with regards to zoning on Rhoda, Tian, and Saipan. And so uh, there is Rota Local Law 8 plus 2, uh, which establishes the zoning code. The Rota Municipal Council was given that additional responsibility under that local law, um, but that they never acted as zoning board. And so, um, in fact, on the same local law, it uh, also uh, uh, was this authorizes the Rota Municipal Council to hire a, um, a zoning administrator. That has never been materialized either. In the same local law also, uh, they're supposed to have a land use plan. That has never existed either. And so I understand because I spoke to our Rota uh, Game, um, Cannabis Commissioner yesterday. And uh, he indicated that there were three commercial applications that were picked up and 12 homegrown applications um, but has yet to be submitted. And so the fact that we don't have any zoning um, board on Rhoda, it raises a concern with respect to, you know, um, this commercial activities. Uh, and so I like to ask this question, is there any restrictions uh, as to commercial activities, um, you know, the sale of this cannabis, nearby schools, churches, or residential areas? No, I, I am really glad that you brought up that question. And the issue of zoning is an important one. Um, the So there's a couple of things in play. There is, um, just to the last point, statutory restrictions on distances from churches, schools, daycare centers, um, and uh, clinics and hospitals. And so the 500 feet requirement does overlay in all of the juristic municipality to where or where can't a cannabis business operate. Further, um, in the regulations, we've, in the absence and prior to the 21-15, the, um, the Saipan local law for the Saipan zoning office, we had an interest in making sure that there was some level of control as to the location of certain marijuana industries, particularly lounges and retail operations. There was, there was um, a need among the commission and a stated goal of ensuring that really the benefits were able to be maximized through um, locations that were accessible to tourists and that the, the any issues and problems can be limited when it comes to uh, locations in residential or in village areas. So within our regulations, we have provisions for lounges and retail operations that in addition to the 500 feet requirements that retail and lounges can only operate within approved uh, marijuana established zones. And the approval of those zones were set up to be established by the commission. Um, but in the absence, and recognizing the absence of zoning in both Tinian and Rhoda, despite the, the local laws, as you mentioned, um, both commissioners from Tinian and Rhoda have expressed an interest in ensuring that the public has an uh, opportunity to comment on the locations and proposed activities. And, and particularly, um, Commissioner Song Song has been very adamant about ensuring that there's public contribution to the location of these areas. And so we feel within our regulations and our ability to hold hearings on applicants, <coughs> excuse me, that um, we would like to open up that opportunity when commercial applications come through for the public to talk about what the use of, of, of that particular land as it relates to the industry. I thank you for that. And so uh, you mentioned that the uh, general public will be provided uh, with the commenting period. So may we know uh, how many days or months is the commenting period? Is it 30 days? Is it 60 days? So um, the, the allowance for hearings is really at the, the call of the commission. So if we get an application uh, from Rhoda, uh, for instance, uh, we can call it within 30 days. We can call it within 60 days. It's, it's really um, uh, whatever would work for the community and making sure that they're aware and be able to participate. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I yield for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Santos. And Senator Cruz, you wanted to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, and good morning to everyone. Uh, after hearing uh, also concerns from the public, uh, I'm very much also concerned of, the, of those uh, yeah, that was mentioned. Uh, the regulation is already set, right? How many have you guys uh, issued already uh, 
permits or for I know that commercial that's have been been applied there right besides uh, personal how many um, how many are already you receive uh, application from uh, for personal consumption currently we do have about three homegrown marijuana registry cards that I'm issuing out today um, I believe that we are working really hard to try to get it out into the community because what the establishment of the Amer homegrown marijuana registry does now since August 4th is it mandates by law that anyone who wants to personally cultivate who's over 21 years of age or older needs to register for a homegrown marijuana uh, registry card for non-commercial use. So as of today, we have received three. I believe that there is still a little bit of confusion within the community, so we're doing our best in terms of PR and marketing to ensure that the the community knows that it's it's now mandated by law. The registry is a requirement in order to cultivate for non-commercial use for those who are over 21. <coughs> and we do have commercial applications. It's just it, they're incomplete currently. Yeah. Because of zoning. <laughs> so yeah, just to reiterate. The the you don't is commission don't issue some kind of a uh, like you know like motor vehicle they issue a, yes. a card driver's license do you have any actually yes do, and, and where, where do they do, do they have this in each and the district or just yes. the central no? correct How? so currently i am the only cannabis commission staff <laughs> so what i am doing is all applications from tinian and rhoda once they are submitted to our satellite offices they will be sent to me I will be issuing out the homegrown marijuana registry cards, which we did already have the complete template. It will be an actual card with the official stamp and my signature on it. It will relay the first name, last name, physical address of the cultivation site, whether they're cultivating in a household or cultivation, uh, another cultivation site, and their um, registration date and date of expiration. So we already have all of those ready. I'm actually issuing out three today. And they'll get a complete packet, complete with a educational material that explains the privileges and prohibitions as a homegrown marijuana registry card holder. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. The so mm -hmm. so uh, in regards to violation, for example, somebody planting and don't know, they don't have any, who, who does the enforcement? Do, do you guys have a? Uh, Enforcers already in place uh, at the commission, or you rely on the attorney general's office? Currently, we are in the works of creating a cannabis enforcement task force. We do not have an enforcement division, unfortunately, at the moment due to lack of staff. But we are working closely with local law enforcement, such as ABTC, Customs, and DPS. Okay. Uh, and uh, I know that federal regulation is always, again, it's, in, it's always in the federal, I know that uh cannabis is uh you know it's not allowed by federal but uh, in regards to uh, i've been also discussing this with uh the community in regards to the commercial side uh and i know that it's 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 a matter of a uh, population how you're gonna make your you make it uh, a, a successful you no know, uh business uh or for the uh, whatever or whatever they they come up with the product no the final product how are you gonna market it because you cannot and I mentioned about three mile no on on, on water uh, to transport is that what you mentioned earlier no no commissioner whatever um what what I was uh, mentioning was um, that the CNMI has ownership over the three miles mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. but there still was. Uh, so uh, an issue I think uh, that I should be able to clarify as to the uh, um, ownership of the submerged lands in the military leased area in the three miles and so where does that jut? So in the event that, for example, uh, the the product in Tinian to transport to Saipan between between the two islands that's over over three miles, right? So definitely cannot unless we go underground and and escape from the from the federal uh, water, but uh, this is something that uh, that I'm thinking whether or not you. I, I'm not trying to tell you guys what to do, but how you guys are going going to 
go about in in a commercial site uh, because even though how much was planted in Tinian how how we gonna market those uh, those plan uh, we want the people to understand also and and I don't know how you guys gonna gonna accept application when it comes to commercial commercial site I know personal there's a lot already everywhere that I go there I see and I hope that they are in compliance with the regulation that's why uh, it has to be enforced and not no you know people get out of control on, on those uh, because uh, we still have to protect also the the community the minors and whatever that whatever that is in the law and uh, we w at the end of the day we don't want to pass the cannabis and uh, we don't want to be blamed uh, for everything that went down on anything that is it is not no enforced or went out of control so i'm asking the commission uh, you know that there should be a enforcer in place and if there's individuals that are in not in in compliance with whatever that is allowable on a commer on a personal side then i think that should be strictly enforced uh, to be honest in the beginning when this came out in 2010 i'm not supporting this kind of uh, legislation but after hearing so many people that are that that this uh, product is helping them on a medicinal side it touches my my heart that i have to you know step up and and you know and help but when things go wrong we always at the end of the day we always the blame so i hope that this uh, uh commission you know you know, you know reach out and, and enforce them that's why Senator Snyder, the vice president, mentioned about the representative from the senator. If something that you know that no the chairman call or even the commission call, I think they should be participating, whether in person or or through Zoom, so that they'll be well aware of what's going on. And when our, the community asks them something, they're not gonna pause and say, "Wait, I have to check." the main office or, or or the the chair to find out what's uh, you know what's what's the the concern of the general public so i i ask for your patience and uh, understanding that they should be always because this is a critical uh uh commission it talks about a a legislation that was passed that is not in you know not authorized by federal regulation and uh, we want to make sure that we're not going to be cited by any federal no authority because of uh, of some out of control uh, uh, activity in our community so uh, you know those are the concerns that I, I would like the Commission to <coughs> to address and make sure that we're not going to be cited by any federal uh, uh, agent of any anything that is when uh, beyond and uh, you know and it's not out of control in, in our community more especially the general public uh, I'm very concerned about if we don't take it very seriously in, in enforcing it then you know, you know like I said and I know Commissioner Guerrero knows this because he's been a legislator for longest or the longest time and you know everything that we pass here and it doesn't work or whether it's a legitimate legislation and and the authority is not following whatever that is in that legislation we're always the blame at the end because we're the representative of the general public that passes legislation so with that I, I thank you also for your attendance this this morning and i hope that whatever whatever needs to be done to fix uh, we're always here to to assist uh are you for now maybe along the way i might be coming up with some concerns and, uh, and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Commissioner Guerrero is raising his hand to yeah. respond to. Former Speaker uh, Guerrero, uh, you have the floor to uh, address some of the comments that uh, uh, Senator Cruz uh, stated. Thank you. Um, Peace, Commissioner Guerrero. Um, 
just uh, assistance, assistant to the commissioners. Um, just to clarify a point that you raised, uh, Senator, and Senator Off Schneider also raised about, <coughs> you know, Tinian and, and Rhoda and how they can partake in this and what are the challenges. Um, there is kind of unique situation here um, where the Commonwealth <coughs> legalized marijuana just like a, a state legalizes, whether it's California, Washington, or Colorado. And when they legalize it, um, the transportation of uh, marijuana, cannabis, uh, within that legal state is, is um, it's clear. I, I, there is no violation of local, I mean, state law. Um, we have a unique situation here where uh, we don't have if we had dry land roads between our islands, I think this may not be an issue. Uh, but because we do have waters that surrounds our islands, um, for Commonwealth law, <coughs> all our um, law enforcement agencies, whether it's DPS, customs, um, acknowledge and recognize that it is legal and they will not um, stop them at the border or prevent you know the transportation of, of marijuana between the islands our issue here is um, there are also federal agencies that um, are also or also have their own mandate to uphold, uh, uphold federal law i.e. we cannot legislate <coughs> <coughs> we cannot legislate that the commonwealth has no authority to uh, affect a, a federal agency's responsibility and so that's kind of out of our hands we you know the issue about the three mile what do you call this uh, territorial waters or i don't know what it, the legal name is um, may not even have a bearing here because let's use Coast Guard as the most relevant federal agency, I guess, in this situation where we may want to transport um, cannabis among inter-island. Uh, they, they do have the jurisdiction uh, of um, enforcing federal law on uh, navigable, navigable waters, navigable navigatable waters they have that even within um, what we call territorial waters and so in the event that they do come upon and in the event that they do um, find on a vessel they may confiscate it um, I you know with each administration federal wise during the Obama administration they were uh, took a very lax approach enforcing um, marijuana. Um, with Trump, I'm not quite sure what their position is, but that <coughs> we, we, like Commissioner Guerrero mentioned, we have raised the issue with the Attorney General's office. And um, I know that there are states such as, as he mentioned, Washington, that does have waters that are also patrolled by the Coast Guard that may be affected. So at this point, it's, it's hard to predict, you know, um, what's going to happen in that case. Um, I haven't heard of anything in Washington or other states where this kind of situation has happened. So. We have yet to see senators, um, but as far as our own state or local governments, we do acknowledge, I mean, it, we've had consultations with them and it is not an issue. It's just our federal counterpart that may have issues with it. Yeah, I just thought I'd clarify that. Thank you. <coughs> and, um, if I uh, could, Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. On, in response to the concerns about enforcement over homegrown, 
I think we share in a lot of the concerns about um, the enforcement ability of homegrown, but we are in a lot of ways, and this is something that we would love to talk with you further about. The statute is a little bit um, contradictory in in uh, refor enforcement responsibilities, particularly for homegrown. Um, largely, the majority of both 2066 and 2105 are business regulatory provisions, uh, regulating the commercial sale and the, the commercial uh, the commerce relating to cannabis. Uh, homegrown is an added component with that, with no commercial um, aspect to it. They they should not be able to to sell into the commercial market from a homegrown uh, plot. But the enforcement and the penalties of that um, is a question of which are civil and which are criminal, and who's responsible for which component of it. If you are a homegrown applicant and you are selling into the black market, that is clearly criminal. Um, no longer in the realm of the commission and more so in the realm of DPS, in, in the legal sales and manufacturing of marijuana. But because of the addition of homegrown within our regulatory framework, it creates complications in a way that, that really um, would be benefited from clarification through the statute. Um, this is a conversation we've had with both the civil uh, components of the AG's office and the criminal side, uh, particularly the criminal prosecutors who deal with uh, drug uh, cases. And um, uh, they share also in, in, in the ambiguity uh, in a way of, of what, who's uh, the responsibilities and enforcement authorities uh, segment segregated between what the commission is responsible for and what is DPS responsible for or the general criminal violations. Thank you. Um, Senator Kidua, Floor Leader Kidua, do you have any um, questions or comments? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, good morning to the director and the commissioners uh, and the special assistant to the commission. I I really applaud the commission and the director for finally coming out with the regulation. Uh, that has been a, a long wait for the community. Uh, however, since this is a new industry, there's still uh, a lot of things to see and then seek uh, amendments to the regulations and to the statute uh, if it uh, need be. And yes, there's a great uh, concern on enforcement. And uh, this, is, this is something that is expected. Uh, even without the legalization of uh, marijuana, we have seen marijuana, you know, throughout uh, uh, the islands. And whether they're on sale or not, uh, that's uh, a question that the commission now will be asking how to regulate the, particularly the homegrown marijuana. And <coughs> I, the question on Tinian and, and Rhoda, uh, in the absence of zoning, uh, if the commission has, has not yet promulgate a regul regulation strictly for Rhoda and, and Tinian. I think it uh, might need to look into it uh, to avoid uh, uh, cultivation, uh, uh, plantation of marijuana, uh, you know, around uh, the, around some homes, uh, family uh, uh, dwellings. Because in here, in Saipan, uh, we have no problem because zoning is there to, to enforce that. And uh, I, I really recommend uh, that the commission not only discuss uh, the issues of marijuana uh, with our attorney general, but uh, sit down with uh, the U.S. attorney general and get guidance uh, in terms of the, the federal side because uh, you know getting on the on the aircraft between islands uh, that's a federal crime to carry a marijuana getting on a on a, on any even outboard mortars that is uh, licensed by the Coast Guard it's illegal to carry a marijuana because it is drugs that are considered by by the uh, the feds so, so that's something that uh, must be discussed with the U.S. Attorney General, 
to so that our people can be well informed and uh, and I think uh, the Commission might want to look at the uh, in the interest of uh, PP Puentinian who are growing marijuana commercially probably to prohibit the trans the, <coughs> the uh, uh, any individual who is uh, you know going to Tinian uh, uh, Rhoda uh, or to Saipan to carry marijuana so they can buy it there when they get there so that the, the business in Rhoda and Tinian you know uh, can have some business but if you're from Saipan and you know you're able to take your marijuana to Tinian the business there or marijuana will not make money and even you know if you're not caught by the feds on the aircraft or on the boat carrying your marijuana so probably that's something to, to think about it and maybe discuss it with uh, the the commissioner from Tinian and Rhoda and see uh, you know if they really want to make business then they should not allow anybody from Saipan or anybody traveling uh, to Rhoda to carry a marijuana from from Saipan the the other one is uh, uh, if the transportation of uh, marijuana between islands is considered uh, an interstate commerce by the feds uh, we might have to to really look into that how serious is that is, is it really is 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 the uh, transportation of, of marijuana between islands uh, an interstate commerce for business uh, <coughs> and then we have to to make uh, that clear to to our people and also uh, since it is illegal under the the, the feds and and businesses who will be uh, doing business with marijuana uh, probably the use of credit cards for business is illegal because the credit card is controlled by the federal government if you cannot deposit it in the FDIC your money then I am pretty sure that you know transacting business through a credit card issued by a US bank or or any uh, financial institution licensed by the United States might be legal <coughs> so these things need to uh, the Commission need to look into and I think the best agency to advise you is the the uh, the uh, US uh, uh, attorney or the US assistant attorney to give you some guidance so probably you can uh, improve your regulations and educate our people more on how to not get into trouble uh, with the federal government and, and they can have their their business uh, uh, in in a manner where they will not be interrupted because of a uh, violation of federal uh, uh, laws and the the issue of uh, interagency uh, permitting is, a, is an issue uh, uh, I know zoning uh, is the as mentioned earlier is an obstacle and when you go to zoning uh, at the beginning zoning uh, used to to have problems even you know you want to get business license on, on house rental you go to zoning zoning will give you a give you a hard time you know because they want all kinds of stuff for just renting a ho your house out uh, you know uh, so now they understand <coughs> that because they have been in in uh, operations for for years so now they understand uh, when you're applying for uh, a house rental business that they do not require you uh, to go and collect all of these things and pay for all these things and in order for them to to approve your uh, simple house rental uh, uh, a permit so so those things uh, 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 zoning must uh, uh, convey to these agencies to really understand even business uh, even the business office and uh, even the business office uh, they still have problems with, uh, you know, the zoning. Uh, uh, I don't know whether those employees that are in the front, 
or not if 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 Johnny uh, uh, if if uh, the, the commission ha had spoken already with these agencies and then the frontliners there were not provided information and when you know an applicant comes and there, there's a lot of questions and hesitancy to to issue or to accept the application because of the lack of knowledge uh, that was not communicated down to them so so that uh, needs to to really uh, uh, have clear uh, discussion with all the agencies actually the permitting agencies including the enforcement agencies because I don't think the Commission can go out and enforce the criminal side you can only enforce your regulation part and make sure that uh, if you're homegrown you can only plant this this many and, and make sure that uh, uh, you are not uh, uh, selling uh, to uh, you know which you applied for homegrown and make sure you're not selling uh, uh, what you, you you're growing at home and uh, Senator Cruz uh, is right uh, even me I I'm hearing all over the place that you know, the people are planting you know at home uh, 100 200 300 trees uh, you know yeah and I, I think they might probably have the the lack of understanding of uh, of this uh, uh, new uh, high industry in the same way so I, uh, the commission has a lot of education to do with our people uh, because we would like to give our young people to to try doing some business but do it in in in, in the most uh, proper and uh, and follow the, the regulations uh, I know that everybody wants to make side money so you don't have to pay taxes you know but uh, uh, if the Commission uh, is back uh, with uh, you know full staff maybe uh, we can start looking into that. Uh, maybe the, the Commission uh, can look into this because it was raised and I was thinking about it uh, uh, even when the law we were debating on, on, on the law for cannabis. Uh, shall we allow CWs to be employed under this industry? Or shall we allow only US citizens and, uh, and, and local residents to be employed? Uh, th that the co I'll, I'll leave that up to the commission to be to be thinking about it because uh, if we are going to create employment for people we have to look into that and see is it proper for legislation to for to enact uh, for the legislature to enact uh, legislation that this industry shall employment shall only uh, for US citizens and, and local residents uh, because uh, we don't want to see uh, businesses uh, submitting CW applications to you know to plan marijuana <coughs> so uh, I'll leave that to the Commission to to uh, to discuss uh, and uh, the I think the biggest uh, uh, obstacle that the Commission is going to to encounter and uh, and, and and that is expected is uh, how do you control uh, this this product once uh, it started uh, and I, I understand that uh, I there are also bigger investors that are, are eyeing this industry and there are also investors that would like to buy all the licenses they want to buy no lounges, lounges. They want to buy uh, cultivation. They want to buy uh, a retail. So, if that really happens, they kill the the you know our, our our young people who would like to to do business in cultivation or, or you know the, the uh, rather than giving them the opportunity to to so the commission uh, shall look into this whether. If somebody comes in and wanted to buy uh, cultivation, uh, 
I wanted to buy the lounge. Uh, I wanted to buy the retail, the wholesale of marijuana for one business, one investor. Then it's killing the, it's going to kill the, the, the others, our, our young people who would like to, to do smaller, like one part of it and then uh, uh, sell it to, to uh, the, the wholesaler. Uh, rather than monopolizing everything uh, under one uh, 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 business. So uh, I don't know how the commission uh, is going to to sell the uh, the licenses, uh, whether one person will be, f you can only have a business for lounge. You cannot have a business to, to uh, cultivate at the same time. And you cannot have a business uh, for, uh, uh, retail uh, at the same time. I, I would leave it up to to the commission to look at it because uh, we should provide opportunities uh, for our uh, young people to. We are encouraging our people to go into business. So if this is the business that they can start with uh, and, and try, uh, we should give them the opportunity. So I'll, I'll leave that up to to the commission to look into it. And as we move forward, uh, maybe. Uh, can be looking at it and whether to limit the big investors from coming in and monopolizing everything or uh, the commission will open it uh, to everybody that comes in uh, that, that with the money. So uh, be thinking about it because uh, we would like to provide opportunities for yes employment is one and the other one is uh, a business. and. Uh, it would be good to provide some education to those who are coming in to apply that this is, is still illegal under federal and that you cannot be depositing your money in your bank account at uh, First Hawaiian or Bank of Hawaii or uh, Bank of Guam because you might be in trouble with, with the feds. So where do you deposit? Do you keep it in the, at home, all the cash? How do you pay your taxes? Because I'm pretty sure there's going to be federal tax that's going to apply here uh, if you're employing people. You will be, you know, they will be playing, paying some federal taxes, social security uh, taxes. So, how is that going to be dealt with? Uh, so, so I will just leave that up uh, to the commission so that they can just, uh, you know. Uh, uh, maybe have some conversations uh, with that and see uh, if there's anything that the legislature can do that within our authority uh, to provide the commission uh, more uh, uh, a wider range of uh, coming up with regulations to, to make sure that uh, uh, the commission's job is implemented uh, accordingly and that businesses at the same time are provided opportunities also to to uh, conduct business uh, in a manner that is prescribed by law and, and by regulation. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, the director will be having some in staff because he can expedite some of the applications that are coming in. I don't envy her for that, uh, you know, one man team. And this is a, a new industry. If it's an old industry, see everything is there already. Applications, it's it's going to be a routine job. But this is a new one. And you have, you're going to be faced with a lot of uh, questions coming in from different individuals. Uh, uh, if you have not experienced it, be expecting it because, uh, especially your generation, your generation is the ones who are going to be asking more questions. Uh, not my generation or or Senator Santos' generation or, or any of us in here because probably we will refrain from doing that kind of business. But for the young people, they would like to venture into it. So, uh, uh, Director, you, if you have not ex ex experienced that, you will be experiencing and, uh, and you know how to deal with uh, your own fears. So, uh, uh, you're the best person to, to deal with them and make them understand. But but that uh, the I, I guess the
commission has the responsibility to educate our community and businesses who would like to venture into this and uh, uh, there's a uh, your special assistant also can can uh, you know provide you a lot of guidance in uh, in uh, some of these things especially when it comes to uh, community uh, uh, outreach because you know he's been around you know uh, people know him he knows a lot of people so as a PR you know, he can be a, a, a great PR too so to promote uh, the industry uh, uh, in a manner that is uh, uh, in accordance with, uh, with the regulations and statute so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield for now and uh, and uh, give the Commission more time to go back and uh, and, and think of w what next to do uh, to uh, ensure that uh, revenues are are made and and that in in a manner that uh, is uh, legal within the boundaries of the regulations and the statute. Uh, because at the beginning, it was supposed to be medicinal, then revenue generation. So uh, that's that's the biggest hurdle is the revenue generation part and how to deal with uh, uh, generating revenues. All kinds of things are going to come. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Abda just mentioned a lot of questions. So. Some of them I know you have addressed already, and some of them probably you're, you're thinking about it. So uh, with that, uh, uh, keep up the, uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, it's a new industry. There's going to be some negative comments, positive comments, but that's the way it is in a new industry. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you for now. Thank you, uh, Senator Hofschneider. And before we move along, um, um, we do have um, on uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams uh, Commissioner from Tinian, Commissioner um, Hofschneider. Um, good morning, uh, Commissioner Hofschneider. I'm not sure if you can hear us or hear me, morning. but um, thank you for yes, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, joining in. Um, would you like to um, uh, say a few words on what you've been recognizing in Tinian? Um, how has the community um, you know, been uh, taking the new industry and have there been any movements? What type of concerns or questions have you got? Would you like to uh, give us a brief statement on that or do you want to wait for some questions from uh, your uh, senators and uh, uh, members of the committee? Can you hear me okay? Yes. really gracious enough to um, collect applications right now um, on, our, on my behalf uh, until I get an office space. Um, they have printed out applications for people to pick up. I noticed that that's one of the things that um, a lot of the people in Tinian are, are, are looking for, so not necessarily using the website to download and print themselves, but looking for applications to be printed for them. So Commerce has been really great doing that. Um, I provided my my information uh, to, to Commerce for anyone to reach out to me and I can meet with them, but honestly, uh, no one has uh, put forward any interests in regard to applying at this point. Just a lot of questions. Thank you, Commissioner Hofschneider. So um, we'll go ahead and move on uh, before we go um, for second rounds and then um, my first round. Um, anyone from the commission? Go ahead, Matt. Um, just in, if there's time to respond um, to the great points that uh, Senator Kitigua brought up. Um, I think it's important to make the, the note that we have met with zoning and zoning in their um, requirement for conditional permits and the delays are really derived in, from Saipan Local Law 21-15. Uh, from the Saipan delegation, which statutorily created the conditional requirement 
for permits relating to the cannabis industry. And to expand a little bit on the MD's comments, uh, under the current law, all permits expire in September of every year. So it's not an annual basis based on when you received your license. Uh, under the current uh, backlog and the current possibilities of zoning boards and the application and the issuance of conditional permits, there's a significant problem that's here in that because they're required to have a zoning board hearing and there's usually only about five applicants per board hearing, if, for instance, we got a surge of microproducers, the smaller operators, the typically more local, the people we really want to encourage to be a part of the industry in the formal industry, for instance, if we had 20 of them, we're looking at having each individual one waiting to receive their business license and therefore their, their cannabis permit months, uh, months to wait for their, their, their hearing, months to wait for a decision, months to wait for, for their, their receipt of their business license. And if they uh, waited till, September, uh, till March, February, ja January, it shortens the period in which they're able to operate within the industry. And it creates a significant hurdle, especially for the young entrepreneurs and the people from here looking at entering the industry. If you only have four months of operating in the business, the question becomes, why do I need to operate formally at all? And so this is a conversation we've had with um, members of the House Committee and the conversation we're hoping to have with members of the, of the Saipan North Island Legislative Delegation in that the hurdles created by 21-15 uh, are significant and will delay um, all progress on all cannabis licenses uh, for a considerable amount of time. Um, secondly, the, the, we had a significant conversation about competitiveness of local operators and ensuring that the benefits of, of commerce within the industry are spread. Um, this is the reason why we uh, wanted to incentivize and push forward with a co-op of microproducers. So under the current regulations, microproducers, those who only can grow 25 plants and under, have to sell to a wholesaler. They can't sell to the retail operation. And the reason for that was because if they were selling to the retail straight or to the lounges, then they would be competing with each other. That each individual 25 plant producer would be competing with each other and would be reducing each other's prices. If you can establish scale, the economies of scale that are required to compete with the larger operators, then that each individual one can generate returns sufficient enough to, to accumulate the capital to advance through the classes of production. Um, without, uh, and so this is a, uh, an issue that is um, <coughs> competing in a way, sorry, <coughs> the mask. So this is an issue that's competing in a way. Um, we want to be able to incentivize large operators that are operating efficiently and getting the product to the market at a reasonable cost. If, you, if we had larger operators doing the efficiencies that are proven in other locations with the experience that are proven in other locations, then you can reduce the price per uh, joint per, per item in a way that can be truly competitive against the black market. Not only will they be more efficient in production that will generate greater supply, therefore lower prices, you would be able to uh, have the ease and the opportunity to buy it formally and buy it within a, a location that would be approved, the location that would be sanitary, the location that would be clean uh, in a way. And so really both encouraging the microproducers and the local producers to be able to compete through a co-op structure and encouraging larger operators with the experience to produce does twofold of trying to accumulate scale within the, the smaller producers, but also generate efficiencies within the industry that can bleed out the black market. There, the, the goal is to get to a point where the, the industry itself and the actors within the industry are operating in a way that makes it almost a necessity that nobody would choose to buy in the black market. Not only would they get more difficulties in legal ramifications, but quality, price, these things are, are all components of scale. And so that's, that's the conflicting intents. And um, <coughs> on the issue of uh, banking, this is something that we've been discussing a lot, um, but it isn't a blanket prohibition, and this is again another issue of scale, is that banks um, are, are really governed by the, <coughs> sorry, by the Bank Secrecy Act and the Anti-Money Laundering Act as it relates to the, to the management of, of cannabis-related money. Um, but, as, uh, but FinCEN, uh, the regulator for these provisions, has provided a roadmap for other states to follow. And so we're, we're not innovating in the field of, of legalized marijuana. It's, it's a fairly regular occurrence, and so a lot of other states have dealt with the issue of banking previously. 
and continue to do so. But there is a process by which you can ensure the safety and the, the reliability of the provenance of the money that's coming in through the system. But that requires a little bit more resources on the, half, on, on the part of the banks. And so as scale develops and as the industry develops, there's more and more rationale to take advantage of the opportunities that are present in providing services to cannabis operators. But really, it's just a matter of building up the industry. And so at the point in time, it's difficult. But if we start to encourage it, if we start to make it easy, again, for instance, in the ease of regulatory permission through zoning and through the other apparatuses, then we can start building it up and getting to a position where the industry itself is really um, allowing for a lot more options to happen, both for local consumers, or local producers, and for uh, off-island investors. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt. Before we move on, I'd like to uh, recognize the presence of our vice chair, um, Senator Sixuigi Somar. We'll uh, give him some time to um, acclimate before he moves on. I know uh, we've we've we're we're well over an hour, but we'll we'll um, we'll continue on for you know a good 10, 15 minutes maybe, uh, just so we can kind of um, uh, cover cover more grounds. Um, I will go for um, second rounds, but I wanna I wanna um, follow on on what Commissioner Guerrero. Uh, Matt, since you uh, ended with the the banking um, uh, clause of the regulations and and the statute, um, right now, um, as the MD said, uh, she is uh, scheduled today to give out uh, three permits or three cards. So I assume that you received payment for these these cards. Um, so uh, my question is, because we were talking about the banking and FDIC and the ability and inability by law, by federal law, to receive uh, um, uh, these monies, um, where, who have they paid? Are they paying into CNMI Treasury? And we have to find out what bank that's going to and see if there's any um, uh, legal issues in that, right? So. Uh, maybe that's something that we can uh, we have to look into um, you know ASAP um, is I know by statute that a special account was created um, for these fees and any other uh, um, uh, penalties uh, or whatnot um, to be funneled to but uh, let's make sure um, uh, where these uh, you know where this special account is and um, um, if we're, we're we're within the confines of of the uh, mandates, you know, even the federal mandates, you know, so we can kind of make sure that we, uh, you know, we're continuing on, um, uh, and and we're we're, we're following the uh, um, the regs and the rules. So um, I have more I have uh, um, more questions and uh, and comments, but I, I know uh, Senator uh, Senator Six Two before uh, I know Senator Santos has a uh, has uh, some questions. Um, you wanna, okay, so Senator 6-2, since he hasn't spoke, he'll yield to Senator Santos, and then, um, you know, I can I can ask him a couple of questions, and then we can move into uh, Senator 6-2. He, he should be ready by then. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Senator Santos. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Vice Chair, for yielding to me. And so, um, commissioners, you know, like, like, like uh, the rest of our good senators here, um, they mentioned that uh, enforcement is one of the uh, challenges with this new industry. However, we are glad that the commission is working closely with our local enforcements. Um, we just need to, you know, uh, be able to effectively uh, handle or combat uh, cannabis thieves. Uh, and the reason for that is because, you know, we don't want to frustrate our producers uh, that instead of them producing to sell, they produ you know, they're producing for can cannabis thieves. And so um, we just want to, again, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that uh, we're able to, again, you know, um, um, address these concerns. Uh, that's all for now, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Santos. Um, let, let me let me um, go ahead and uh, before I recognize um, any other member, I know Senator Cruz has um, uh, some questions. Maybe I can post some uh, um, some questions, um, and these are just general questions uh, from uh, some of our constituents and some of the the viewing public who are um, watching right now. You know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of complex you know uh, complexity. I mean the content of the language uh, in in the legislation and both regulations. It's it's really I've I've uh, I haven't finished going through everything. I've skimmed through uh, you know bouncing back and forth through subsections and and uh, um, sections of the regulation um, uh, as well as the legislation. Um, and and we do recognize that there are basic simple questions from our 
our community and constituents in regards to uh, um, uh, different aspects of the, the industry in general. One question that uh, uh, stood out before me um, uh, from, from our, our, our viewing public is, uh, maybe this is something we have to look into, um, if an applicant for a cannabis permit, um, it doesn't matter which permit, it could be homegrown, it could be uh, um, uh, commercial, um, if that applicant is receiving social security benefits, right, um, is he or she el uh, eligible for a permit uh, by regulation or federal law since um, cannabis or marijuana um, is still a class one uh, controlled substance, right, under the, the, the federal uh, law. So they were, they were making sure, which is, um, you know, it's very, very, you know, I'm very comforted that they're, they're concerned about that because they don't want to take that step forward and sacrifice, you know, uh, um, um, what they're receiving. So um, have you, MD, have you, have you came across those questions or so? Um, person A is receiving disability benefits from Social Security, but he or she wants to um, apply for a permit and be able to cultivate uh, homegrown cannabis and maybe have a macro license as well. Um, has, has, has that ever um, uh, been a concern of the commission or has that question ever, ever um, uh, been asked? No, that's never been asked um, from a potential applicant, whether from the commercial or non-commercial side, but I think that's something that we'll definitely discuss with the commissioners and SA as well. So yeah, taking note of that question. Thank you. Does the commission have a um, assigned AG working with with uh, with the commission? So, th so there is um, on each meeting. Uh, maybe these 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 would be some good questions, and also the banking question. Um, you know, are we going to have to relaunch our, um, our 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 government credit union, or you know, uh, whatnot to to receive these funds? So we just want to make sure that we're we're operating in in confines of the uh, the mandates and the and the um, our federal laws. Um, Have we, we've been working with the other agencies to partner up? Have there been any MOUs, MOAs, and uh, you know, with, and, and, and I'm happy in, uh, to, to hear that um, Commissioner Hofschneider has been partnering up with the Department of Commerce to uh, assist her in, in applications in Tinian, but uh, has the commission been in, in communication and dialogue with agencies that, that uh, maybe have assistance to, uh, to you know, rolling out um, uh, uh, you know the regulations and and operations of the the commission. Yes. So first, for permitting and licensing regarding homegrown and cannabis commercial licensing, for Saipantinian and Rota, we did come into agreements with local agencies here, especially with our current Saipan office still under renovation, hoping to open up in September. We do have an uh, a MOU agreement with the Casino Commonwealth Casino Commission. Uh, to utilize just for application intake. They do not um, participate in any processing of applications. It's literally just a window for our um, applicants to submit their packages. The Tinian um, Satellite Office, we're currently utilizing the DLN, uh, Department of Commerce in Tinian's uh, customer service intake window, which is also being overseen by our commissioner, Journey Hofschneider in Tinian. And in Rhoda, we are utilizing the administrative office of DLNR and our commissioner, Thomas Song Song, is overseeing that office as well for me, currently due to the lack of staffing. Um, like I mentioned earlier too, we are looking into going into memorandums of agreements with um, various law enforcement agencies such as DPS, Customs, and ABTC. Those are still in the works as we fine tune and meet with the criminal division and the civil division of the AG's office to ensure that we're taking the necessary uh, steps to ensure that our agreement can be something that is done between the both parties. Thank you, MD. Um, so before I uh, recognize Senator Six to um, let's 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 schedule and meet on on. on the needed changes for the the zoning uh, um, uh, the, the zoning law that that was recently passed. Uh, we do have three of us here: uh, myself, Senator 
uh, Kiruba and Senator Igesomar, uh, members of the, the Saipan Northern Island delegation. Um, I do sit as a floor leader of the, the SNAO delegation, so um, you know I can assist in that. And if we need, you know, we're gonna, and it, it sounds like we need to move move on that um, uh, quickly. Um, let's let's schedule um, uh, some dialogue between us so that we can, uh, you know, get the language um, uh, worked on so we can, uh, you know, fix that fix that issue. Okay, uh, go ahead, uh, Senator Six. If you have any uh, just opening uh, statements or questions or concerns or whatever you've been hearing, um, I know you're the uh, uh, initiator. So let's uh, um, with our, our our former speaker. But uh, go ahead. We'll go ahead and give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I apologize for my uh, absence and tardiness. There was just so many things out there I had to take care of. But uh, unfortunately, I was not able to hear uh, the presentation by the uh, commission. However, uh, I guess what I would ask for and uh, hopefully to gather from you guys uh, on that next meeting that our chairman is requesting is I would like to see a Gantt chart of the commission with respect to your programs or your action plans moving forward from today or ground zero moving forward uh, on this action plan to so we can see what exactly the task that you are working on to help us understand better. I understand when you, you come here, you talk, it's all verbal and narrative, but uh, it'll be nice to see these visual charts. And in this Gantt chart, hopefully you'll be able to at the same time include in there your personal cost that's costing you and or operation cost moving forward from month to month basis. And whether there's a task you're working on with respect to this zoning task that you're working on, uh, showing what exactly is going to happen on month one, month two, month three, month four, and then also on this banking issue, uh, where are you on this banking issue, and the issue surrounding the micro licensing, uh, and uh, for example, and seeing the cost. That would show us at least it will be a visual for us, but at the same time it shows your uh, accountability on you and an accountability on us that we've communicated and that we understand. Right. Otherwise, everything we hear today, once we leave this room, uh, may may not. We may have a different uh, timelines. Your timeline and my timeline may be personal and subjective, and not realizing that you have other obstacles that is ahead of you. And uh, also, the one that uh, Matt was mentioning with respect to the efficiencies of micro licensing towards retailer and or wholesaler or distributor. I think it would be nice, uh, you know, I work a lot with uh, charts and most especially diagrams. And there are softwares out there where you can simply move diagrams around and it's almost like writing a computer program that shows these things, if and or. And that way, it's an easy visual art, visual presentation. And the reason why I say this is it's really for me to help us, but also help you because it is very, I think we're, Okay, our chairman, we'll be back. We'll be right back. So, uh, I think it's, it, you're, we really, as in our tourism, we are counting on you on all making this thing happen, whether personal use or commercial use. And we really need to see progress from you. And these things that I'm requesting for will provide accountability so that will be on task. It will help the director, the board, and the AG, and everybody else, so that we can be there. For example, this issue I did here, I received a text regarding the zoning, and to myself I was like, wow, why am I receiving this message? Why should I be concerned about zoning now, or why would the legislature be? So it's like, for example, uh, I would had hope that you would have already, maybe, maybe you already did inform the House, or inform the legislature, uh, with this plan that we have scheduled out, we have a situation here. We need this fixed. Legislature, look into this policy. Is this valid or not? Can you change or make this happen or not? <coughs> and we'll take care of that policy on that zoning aspect. On this banking issue, this is not new, as Matt is stating. Uh, we know it's, all, it's out there. The only thing that for me in our question and our former speaker in authoring this bill for passing from the House is we know all these issues are out there. All the legal questions are out there. 
Can we do it or not do it? Can the state or territory do it or not do it? The thing we want or uh, we expect from the commission is that you are the experts now and that you present to us the solutions to them, right? What exactly are you going to do or we're going to do together to make it work? So I totally understand this banking, and that was a very good question. Okay, they pay, so why now? It's going to Treasury, okay. Does it even really matter if it goes to Treasury and goes to the bank? Can we just handle that? Or do we need to open up our credit union immediately? Like, the decision you're discussing, I'm thinking, must be made yesterday, already. Do we need to discuss the credit union? If not, do we need to discuss the Commonwealth Bank that's in our Constitution to have created, to hold the funds of the CNMI money? instead of going to the private banks. So those are issues that you as the experts now, you give it to us or let us know when you're gonna give us, what do we need to do so that we can make it happen. I know FinCEN, I mean, I try to understand FinCEN as well. It's very complicated. I just stopped at the CFR regulations on them, on what we're supposed to do. But I do know that there are three categories of what exactly how we should be operated on. And so from that as well, you know that complication I'm hoping that, and, I, and you are doing it, I, I do hear the uh, media press that you're giving, is to make sure that people are educated, and most especially aside from the personal use of this and responsibility. The business is that when I get this license, I know what will work and not work because it will be futile, it will be useless for me to have this license if I don't know what to do with the money, right? When I'm just hoping that you'll be the one to guide. Do I dig a ground and stuff the money in there and put security guards over it? Or in a safe with security guards? Or how do we transact? So I, uh, for me, uh, sorry, I apologize. Need not respond, but I hope that we have these written responses on these uh, diagrams, flow charts for us to see so we can see how we can help you in advance before it actually happened. So we can see these choke points that may happen ahead of us. And now, Mr. Pres uh, Chairman, and Sujus Mosi. Thank you, Senator Sixtu. Um, I know Senator Cruz was looking at me earlier. Do you have anything, Senator Cruz, before I recognize Senator Kirua? Right. Or did you want to comment on it? I'm going to give you guys time to comment on, on some stuff. We'll just uh, finish this, this round, and then we'll close out with you guys. OK? Is that, is that fine? OK. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Senator Cruz. Chairman Cruz, go ahead. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I was looking at the uh, the application on 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 commercial site. Uh, it's just stating the the square feet of the of the area. But uh, for example, I know the micro producer is only twenty five uh, mature. But what about the others? Uh, how many plants are in on there's class one class two and class three it's only stating the the square feet of the area is that unlimited uh, plants or um so they're they're in other jurisdictions uh the micro producer is sort of a unique one for here in designating it by mm -hmm. plant typically other jurisdictions do it by cultivation size canopy space square footage designation so it really comes down to the efficiency of the individual producers, how much yield they can get per square foot. Some people are able to get larger yields per square foot, which is to their efficiency and their investment into technology, whether it's aeroponics or hydroponics or these things. So really it, it comes down to the individual um, entrepreneur and the individual business owner to see how much yield they can derive from a, from a square footage. So you could, you could get a lot of yield from a smaller class one license versus a class three license, depending on how you produce. But simultaneously, that's a business decision and has implications for their individual business as they go forward. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not against the, the, the application. I'm just, I uh, want to have the idea just in case someone comes to me and uh, asking how much uh, plan is allowable on, on these three class, classes. So uh, uh, do we have any potential at the moment that is interested in doing Cannabis uh, commercial, uh, 
any any potential no that is, is it a, a US citizen or outsiders or something like that uh, we've any had any? a mix of both local and um, off-island investors uh, we see more so locals gearing towards class one if not micro producer um, I have received um, comments saying that they would like to start off in class one and hopefully or potentially move on to class two just to see first, to get their foot into the water, to see first how the cultivation within a class one um, square footage would probably also lead to maybe a class two in the coming years. Um, licenses are only, are only available for, are only renewable yearly. So they have the opportunity at their next renewable application to either, if there are um, open slots for another uh, cultivation license, they are able to apply for a bigger square footage. So let's say someone wants to start off in class one, realizing that they can probably um, cultivate in a class two, they would be able to apply for a class two. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any one day inquire uh, or acquire a property or they're acquiring private property or public public land? Oh, on this one. no public land, only private. So private. Privately owned. So they, they don't, there's no in, uh, interested but of interested, you know, either investor or individual that interested to, to do a cannabis uh, commercial that you know that they're acquiring public land? Um, unfortunately, no. On uh, 20-66 um, clearly states that no cannabis licensee or homegrown marijuana registrant can cultivate on public land per statute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, now on, on the the homegrown, uh, those, those are personal uh, use. And I see the ap application that from 6 to, to 12 or 6 mature and 12, you know, immature. But there is on a medicinal site that it says unless unless, I don't know, prescribed by the physician or, or deemed necessary by the physician. Do we have any physician that entertaining uh, marijuana medicine over here in, in the cinema? Currently we start in the talks. Or, we, oh, or just, just, just to be sure that, just in case you put in the application, Within but not necessarily somebody uh, is allowed uh, to administer or, or, or uh, prescribe any currently in the regulations there is a reserve section for medicinal marijuana we are currently in the talks with CHCC to try to develop that program that part of the program but currently there is no medicinal marijuana um, regulations at the moment but that doesn't hinder someone who may be seeking who is 21 years of age and older that may be seeking marijuana for medicinal use from applying for the homegrown marijuana registry as long as they provide the necessary documentations and required information, they'll be able to receive their card. Thank you. I, I, I raised this uh, in the event that it is really deemed necessary for to have more than six. And it's say, say, saying here in the application 24, no? Up to 24. Uh, if, if in case no one does prescribe in marijuana medicine no, in, in any institution here where do we go about with this application that's allowed 24 matured uh, marijuana so um some some distinctions um doctors typically around this nation and, and in other jurisdictions don't necessarily prescribe uh, marijuana it's more of a recommendation they're not allowed to prescribe um but we have been talking about in the absence of a formal structure or the ability of, or the interest of local providers to provide recommendations for marijuana usage, some reciprocity or agreement in, in, up in applying if you've received that recommendation from another jurisdiction and that recommendation is valid, that that validity of that recommendation be transferred over and accepted by, by local medicinal dispensaries or uh, increased ability to grow on the homegrown side. So, so if a physician said recommended it's okay then the commission is okay with uh, with the 24. Yeah, I think that's something we would discuss um, as we get through it. There's, oh. It's really important, at least for the local strains and the local product, that especially for the medicinal, there is a level of testing and laboratory results. 
for that particular population because of the vulnerabilities that could be existing. Um, we do have the, the process uh, to allow for commercial sale uh, without testing, as long as it's labeled as such by law. Um, but when it comes to the medicinal, when it comes to the more sensitive, uh, more, um, more health-related health aspects of the industry, medicinal um, or edibles, then this is something that we want to make sure that we have the capabilities to test locally or to do some level of analysis as to especially pesticides, the, the level of pesticides that are being used um, on pesticides or fertilizers being used for the particular plant. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice. Okay, I think a uh, former speaker has uh, um, some comments. So go ahead, uh, former speaker, and then I'll recognize Senator. Thank you. <coughs> um, first of all, Chair, I'm going to have to beg your indulgence. I need to leave at about 12 <coughs> for to get other prior uh, commitments. Uh, just two things to touch on. Uh, with regards to the medicinal uh, center, uh, we have been in consultation already with the CHCC, uh, the Esther, and we be we've begun the dialogue already about implementing the medicinal component or program of cannabis. Uh, they also, uh, we, we do need them to take part, uh, especially to um, To, to define what qualifying medical conditions are so that they can be, um, can qualify for these recommendations. And, and we need to build that in to our regulations. I think Matt has already said that um, a, lab, a lab is needed uh, for testing, um, not just, um, to uh, how, how's this w with uh, medicinal grape marijuana there are different strains that are proven for different types of conditions um, not just anything uh, secondly um, there's also the issue of dosage now with um, our act there is a prescribed what the dosage whether it's for um, liquids, solids, edibles, and so forth. Those are, um, um, dosage is important. So that needs to be confirmed through testing. Now, we're a long ways off right now, but we have begun the dialogue. Um, Esther, the, what is her title? Administrator? CEO. CEO has already, um, um, what do you call this, said that she'll be consulting with the, their board and their, their physician's board, and we will be meeting with them uh, to, <coughs> what do you call this, to develop the needed um, criteria and um, to refine our regulations to implement Medicinal. So I, gu I guess just the point of that is that we're already going in that direction. Obviously, without a laboratory, uh, we would not be in a position to implement the medicinal. Although <coughs> um, the law does give um, some advantages to uh, medical medicinal marijuana patients, such as um, being able to grow more than what would normally be allowed. Um, if they choose to purchase it at some point when the, once this is available uh, from the retail um, dispensaries, they get a, a discount of half of what taxes is normally going to be imposed. But um, I just wanted to share with the senators that we're not there yet, but we are <coughs> work that direction. The second point I want to make is um, about the bank issue. Now, you all recall, <coughs> Chairman, that we did create a separate account, a special account for cannabis, 
not to be mingled with uh, the general funds and that the intent of that is to protect um, agencies that are receiving grants from being penalized for if we commingle um, these funds. So from a government side, there is uh, protections there. For the private sector side, the issue that the centers faced um, density, not being able to, um, what are they gonna do with the revenues they generate? Are they gonna hold it? Are they gonna deposit it in a bank or what? What are the options for them? In, in most legal states, um, as Matt had already pointed out, the op there is an option of banking. It is uh, still, uh, it's, it's optional for the banks. There is, there are guidelines, FinCEN guidelines, uh, reporting requirements that banks have to comply with in order to service uh, CRBs, cannabis related businesses, right? MRBs rather. Uh, so there is that. FDIC banks are not going to go that route. So Bank of Guam, Bank of Hawaii and others. Here in the CNMI we have um, a few non-FDIC banks and we have also, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, reached out to them uh, to inform them that this industry is you know, in the works and that there is uh, an option. We referred them to, gave them resources to look into the FinCEN regulations and to see if they are willing to service uh, this industry. It's purely optional from the bank side because it is um, rigorous, time consuming, and a lot of reporting. It's also optional on the M MRB side, the retailers, producers, and so forth, to partake in that. Even if a bank here said, yes, we are able to service uh, your business, it is also very expensive. And so many businesses, MRBs in the States, some did partake in it, some said, I'm going to take my chances. I am going to hire security guards, buy a big expensive vault, and, and um, deal with it that way. I mean, this can run upwards of, you know, over $1,000 a month just to be able to have a bank account. And so they have to weigh in whether it meets their needs or uh, whether it's, fee you know, feasible financially. Just wanted to share with uh, you all that um, there is a way, but it is, um, we can't tell either party, you have to. Obviously the government, any government, any state or federal government uh, would like to see that this industry, the revenues goes to a bank. It, it just, it's, it's good for government to see that there is some accountability in this cash-based industry, we want that. This is the same challenges they're facing in the U.S. of A. And um, we know that states are questioning their lawyers to address this issue. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, uh, there has been uh, bills, the Safe Banking Act has been introduced earlier it got out of committee from the house but we will just have to see if, if that is passed into law it what it would do is basically um, remove penalties that FinCEN would have would probably um, impose on banks if that thing gets lifted then I guess we're all states and territories would be able to um, be able to, you know, have it bank. Just so you know, uh, in the absence of 
these uh, banking um, businesses, MRBs, are getting creative um, and using, what do you call it, um, blockchain, Bitcoin as currency. Um, we want to, we want it, Chairman, just as all you all do, we're trying to find ways, we're meeting with the sh stakeholders. Um, and um, we'll, we'll be, I guess, updating you uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Got it. Thank and you. With uh, that, I have to apologize, Chair, Commissioners, and Senators. Uh, I, have, I have to leave. Thank you and yes. call me anytime. Okay. You're excused, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, former Speaker, for being here um, and giving us insight. Uh, go ahead, Senator Kiruba, and then we'll just wrap up after, after that. Uh, no thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two, just two items. Uh, first, because of uh, so many issues with zoning, and Mr. Chairman, you you asked the commission to that you will be scheduling a, a future meeting so that we can discuss uh, amendments to zoning. Do you require the home grow? Uh, uh, application to go through zoning? Uh, per statute, no. There is no statute stating that homegrown marijuana registrants should um, submit their zoning authorization. Um, right. But what we do require from a um, homegrown registrant is proof of ownership of the land or deed or a if they are renting, let's say, a rental unit the lease agreement or sublease agreement with the head lease agreement with a authorized statement from the leaser um, or landlord, sorry, landlord to allow them to cultivate marijuana on that space. Okay, and, and to kind of ease a uh, little bit of the restrictions on, uh, on zoning, uh, as recommended earlier, look through the, the kinds of, of licenses that you're going to be issuing, uh, which ones there can we exempt from zoning so that the commission, the commission already has its own regulation and by statute also there's some uh, protection there. So which ones there uh, shall be exempted from zoning because uh, it's, it's zoning uh, now uh, requires everything for blueprints, for for uh, site plans, uh, estimate of uh, uh, the cost of construction, or the cost of uh, uh, your business, how much you're gonna make. So you, I think they're assessing the fees based on what you put down uh, on on paper, and also they're they're requiring. How did you get your property? You have to, to provide proof to get your property. A homestead, even, even if the, the, the deed is saying it is yours, they still want proof and they want proof not that it's your property, but how did you get it? Did you buy it? Did you inherit it? Did you, is it a homestead? So, so those are the kinds of uh, our requirements are, are, are hindrance to to any application. I I presented you my my land deed. You still want me to prove uh, to you uh, where did I get it? How did I obtain it? Uh, you know, so so those things I, I I like to recommend if if zoning can look at your 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 licenses, which ones they're actually does not need zoning uh, uh, permit so we can amend the statute and and if we if we need to amend the the CNMI statute we will amend the CNMI statute uh, because I don't think we can we can uh, amend through the SNIO the CNMI statute it has to go through through the the House and the Senate. So, so in our next meeting, uh, please uh, look at that and see where we can help in terms of uh, legislation to ease up some of the, the issues that uh, now uh, the applicants are facing. It's a new industry, and zoning is applying 
the permits like any other business uh, on requiring public hearings, uh, requiring uh, give me your blueprint. I want to see your windows, where your windows going to be, uh, where your doors going to be, where's your storeroom, and, and where's, uh, uh, the, where's the, nat the, the natural vegetation, you have to show it, and all of those things. So I, 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 I feel that that's unnecessary, uh, discouraging our, our, our young people from venturing to that kind of business. So let us know. Which ones there shall be exempted from from zoning, uh, and uh, we will go from there. So, Chairman, thank you. Already, so for um, the final round, we have the last two: uh, Senator Six Two and then uh, Senator Jude will close up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first question: Did because I'm trying to recollect back, and I'm skimming through the statute. Did the statute authorize giving license to medicinal retailer? So there is a mis uh, medicinal dispensary, which the provision that would benefit a medicinal dispensary from selecting that option would be a, a reduction in the BGR surcharge. Okay. Surcharge. Uh, and the reason I'm asking that is I know that Senator Cruz asked that question, but I want us to be very clear that there are two types. There's two medicinal. When we talk of medicinal, there's two areas. Of course, there's issues in the statute about laboratories. Uh, the statute was a little bit silent, not too much details on the medicinal aspect when it comes to a laboratory. Because any medicinal product that is to be retailed out must satisfy possibly FDA regulations and a laboratory must satisfy the testing to make sure it is consumable by humans, right? So that's why that area is a little bit too sci-fi, too high-tech because Guam went out and suffered on that issue. But in the statute, when, I sp when we wrote medicinal, we said medicinal patient, person using marijuana for medicinal use. Medicinal marijuana and marijuana that's used for medicinal use. The reason being that was used is because it's really, that definition is really honed towards the personal use of marijuana. Because we understand these laboratory stuffs and the retail stuffs, that's gonna be a hurdle that you will deal with in right in these regulations that you're going to have to come up with under testings, but there's it's twofold because a person needing marijuana, the idea is we do not want them to go into a pharmacy or to a retailer and buy the marijuana, the marino or barino. We were not thinking of that in the very beginning in the 19th legislature. That's what we were thinking, but then that's why we refixed it now, right? So the idea is the reason why that term is important is when. A person goes to a doctor and recommends, not prescribe, the person can use it. And so the person can plant to use the plant that they plant or co-share from other personal use to share with that person to either bo boil the roots or boil the leaves or do whatever natural they can with it themselves without going through a lab. So that's why I want to make it clear that when we discuss medicinal use, we need to clarify that medicinal use retail through laboratory testings or medicinal use for a person. And the reason why that was also important to clarify is because one thing we did not really address in the statute is a person who is positive on THC. And that's why this is important. If I got authorization from a doctor to use this and my reason is medicinal use, then I can deal with what other uh, rules and applications for it from you, but just to authorize me. But once I get a license to plant, I really don't need that authorization unless I need to plant more, right? So then, if I'm positive, the next question we need to ask, which we're going to test it out through this whole usage, user, is how do we address people who are positive? And that's why this provision in the statute is supposed to help them at least on the foundation that I am authorized to use it for medicinal use. I'm positive. Now, CNMI, what do you do with a positive individual who is working? And that's something that we need to address in the near future. How do we deal with employees? Do we outside, outright say no government employees, period, shall be positive? Or in all enforcement shall not touch it at all, period? Those are the things we need to clarify. All federal employees, 
or do we authorize employees to be positive, provided that we don't rely on a simple test, but a very detailed test, because that THC will be in you for more than 30 days, even though you use it a long time ago, even though you're sober. And that is why we need to also discuss that, because our current DUI system may need to be amended. You cannot just pull over somebody and say you're DUI if five, three to five other categories are not satisfied as per California law as well. You cannot just say he's stoned or high on the marijuana if you have, based on just a single test, if you have no evidence of what actually happened that you think he's stoned. So I think that's something we need to reveal on our DUI or DWI as well policies on somebody who is also affected while driving or at work. He may be positive, but that person is not high. So that's why, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm going further, but we need to clarify that the question of Senator Cruz on medicinal, we need to clarify that which side are we addressing, the retail aspect or the medicinal use of a personal use. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, um, Senator Kilwet. Uh, thinking about the medicinal, uh, I understand that there's we have quite a number of veterans here, the young veterans who are uh, discharged uh, for medical disability, and they are uh, uh, diagnosed with PTSD. Do they still need to go to the hospital to get any kind of uh, recommendation uh, if they have their own papers from uh, the military that uh, they release? They are discharged because of uh, medical disability and due to their PTSD situation? So th I think there's um, two trains of, of dialogue that were happening with the creation of the law, um, like, like Senator Igasoma was saying. There was the one train that was trying to do um, medicinal marijuana, and there was the one train trying to do commercial. And so what we have as a result is that really the medicinal components as it relates to individuals participating in smoking or, or imbibing in marijuana is really only, the restrictions are only placed on 18 to 21, to 20. Anybody above 21, regardless if they have a medical condition or not, are able to use marijuana. And so um, whether it's for medicinal use, whether it's for recreational use, if we were to establish a medicinal system that permitted, let's say, um, uh, an individual to purchase at a dispensary or to do home growing, the real distinction is that that would typically only open up 18 year olds to 20 year olds and those under potentially, I mean, there's no real statute on, on I mean, I think it is 18 by statute, 18 to up to 21 years old, would, that would be the opening. Um, the additional components are like, you're able to grow additional plants and you're able to uh, buy at a dispensary at potentially reduced cost because taxes are different. But in the instance of, of, a, of, of a veteran coming home with a, with a medical condition, uh, under present law, there's really nothing that, that would prohibit them from going out and getting um, the m marijuana item that they, that they saw necessary to treat. Go ahead, uh, Senator Hofschneider. Thank you for our last round, and then we'll close, we'll, we'll close out. Thank you. I, I didn't know, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be the one to close on you. But I'll, I'll close, but <laughs> just for the last <laughs> round. You close out the last <laughs> round. Yeah. Um, first, I wanted to uh, thank you, Journey, for joining us. Uh, certainly appreciate the uh, representation that you you uh, do for the island of Tinian. And I know that, uh, you know, it couldn't have come at a worse time when you guys are trying to kickstart this and then we have all these outside uh, uh, instances. But I... Uh, I mean, on, on incidences rather. Um, but may I ask, uh, did we ever do a uh, uh, an actual uh, presentation on the other two islands, notwithstanding the cost to go down and all that? But did we, is there a plan for uh, to do one? Yeah. I mean, it's not because they're not being represented. I think it's good for the community of Sonic to to do a. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but the cannabis commission. Because there are some questions I heard uh, Commissioner Journey earlier. I think that's more on the question side. I'm not quite sure exactly, uh, irrespective of what the question is, but to roll out, no? The um, yeah, so we did plan on going in January. Um, and 
I think our way forward was we wanted to promulgate our regulations initially, but of course funding um, happened. You know, we did have a budget set for Rhoda and Tinian. Um, unfortunately, when we came back from a COVID shutdown, our budget was taken away. So now we, we don't, we have that obstacle in, in trying to fund for the commissioners and at least the, the managing director um, to head there. But hopefully in the next fiscal year, we'll be able to find funding to appropriate for that purpose. Um, in the meantime, we do encourage, and, and actually we didn't have to try so hard because Tinian and Rhoda, uh, the commissioners, are very willing to answer any questions. Um, you know, we don't have a set office um, for Tinian. Uh, Rhoda is a little bit more established in that they have DLNR supporting the, um, their function there as a established cannabis commission office. Um, but we don't stop the communication just because there's no funding to go. Um, we do have um, Commissioner Hofschneider and Commissioner Songsung that are very willing to answer any questions. We also have email addresses I don't believe we have an established phone line, but we do have both an email address for Tinian, for Rhoda, and if they want to contact us directly, we have an email address for that as well. So hopefully uh, okay. it, it, we'll be able to. I, uh, sure. also, Go ahead. But, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Journey. Go ahead, uh, Journey. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to mention, make mention that um, I also sent out a bulletin to all the agencies in Tinian just to let them know that I, I am here, um, giving them an update on where we were as far as implementation, you know, providing the government address for the applications, and then also just making sure that they understand that uh, anyone that they they hear from or them themselves, agencies, that I'm, I'm happy to, to meet and discuss anything, and also advising that we, we absolutely intend to have, you know, educational outreach. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that was, that was clear to, to all the agencies in Tinian. Thank you, Journey. That's, that's great. And, and I want to also mention that prior to the shutdown, uh, we, I received some correspondence from your staff, your assigned staff. I think Ms. Uh, Barcinas, no? Jamie? at the time uh, and uh, she was very Correct. she was very fluid in her communication to and fro uh, to and from for members of the delegation so I appreciate that so I just kind of want to restart that and uh, you know Senator Cruz and I of course and the mayor of Tinian would uh, certainly uh, uh, once we get things kind of set look you know we're still being uh, rocked by all this uh, situation the last couple months last four months so we, we want to make sure that we uh, we're, that we're here to to assist in any way, and uh, uh, we will request a, a, a permanent office through the mayor for uh, the commissions uh, to attend to public uh, uh, concerns or to facilitate the public service uh, on the island. But if there is anything else, uh, please know that uh, we are very. Um, uh, able to and excited to hear from you via the chairman or any of our respective offices no okay thank you mr chairman and now you back and thank you for being here thank you journey all right thank so you. let's uh we'll go ahead and um, wrap up any closing remarks from uh from the commissioners or md before officially closing say thank you for having us here today there is a lot of questions that were posed today that are very relevant to not only Saipan, but Tinian and Rhoda as well. I'd like you guys to know that the commission is trying to streamline to ensure that all islands are included into the actions that are taken by the commission, into the discussions, every commission meeting, every correspondence, any changes goes directly straight to every other island. The, the emails that were created in order for our constituents or individuals who are interested from Tinian, Rhoda, and Saipan they're streamlined to me. Everything comes to me. Rhoda and Tinian always provide to me the concerns of Rhoda and Tinian. Um, we are, of course, understaffed, but just the support of having the commissioners, you know, taking an extra step, whether it's providing materials, supplies, um, pretty much just advice, has been very 
it's been a challenging time trying to set up the commission, but it's not necessarily something that is impossible. Um, I think that especially with COVID and this pandemic happening right now, we have to really fine tune and tweak the way that we we begin. And so thank you for your support and we, we look forward to prov providing you that information on thank you Vice Chair uh, Iggy Somar for mentioning that. That is something that I, I do think that we need to pr provide. That way we're also all on the same page. But other than that, any other questions, concerns, especially from those who are asking you personally about cannabis, please direct them to me. Um, all information can go to, our, to info at cinemicannabis.org. Yes. So I'm an open book. Let me know. Alrighty. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you. Um, uh, MD. So with that, you know, let's say thank you to um, our commissioner, uh, our, our commissioners that are here uh, for making time. Thank you, Journey, for uh, tuning in. And we, I want to um, let it be known that the the committee, the cannabis committee, cannabis and gaming committee, will uh, make some time to also hold um, uh, some meetings in the future um, in the uh, first and senatorial districts, so that our our community members there um, can be allowed to participate in in the in you know in the discussions and and, and decisions that, that will be made, but. Um, uh, to the commission, I will be sending you a list of, of questions. And I think uh, uh, Lex has emailed you uh, um, the first round of those questions, if you can get those back to us. Um, and you know, we'll have a continued dialogue. We all have our unique roles in this industry, um, specific roles and unique roles, um, you as uh, commissioners, uh, as a director, and us here um, as members of this, this committee. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you again. And now I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn from Senator Sixu. Any second? Second by Senator Cruz. Discussion? All in favor to adjourn this King gaming meeting, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Motion carries. The committee meeting is hereby adjourned.